Good morning, and welcome to our Thursday series right before spring breaks. Thanks for coming out. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Timothy Kasser, who teaches psychology at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, not too far away from here. He's the author of a number of scientific articles and books on materialism, values, and goals, and other topics, including The High Price of Materialism, Psychology and Consumer Culture, Meeting Environmental Challenges, The Role of a Human Identity, and Lucy in the Mind of Lemon. Lenin, I'm sorry, not lemons, but Lenin. <laughs> He'll be speaking with us today about um, values and caring for others, um, including how we take care of the environment. And he is joining us today, as I said, from Knox College. So please join me in giving Dr. Timothy Kasser a warm Andrews welcome. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I know that spring break is uh, beckoning, and I appreciate you coming uh, this morning to hear what I have to say. So um, what I want to do is to start with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. So as you certainly know, King for many years fought against the problems of racism in the United States in the 1960s in particular. But towards the end of his life, before he was assassinated, he started to realize that the problem of racism was intertwined with other problems in America. And in a speech he gave very near the end of his life, he talked about the, the threefold problems of racism, militarism, and materialism. And what he said during that speech was that we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Now, unfortunately, it's very clear that that uh, radical shift of values has not happened in our country. Instead, it seems like we've continued to move towards more and more of a thing-oriented society. We can see that by um, the fact that advertisements are just about anywhere we go in our world, in lots of places that I'm sure King couldn't even have imagined at the time, including people's foreheads. And as this shows, um, even on people's report cards, so this is the report card envelope that children in Seminole County, Florida brought home. And those of you sitting in the back, I'm sure probably can't see. Down in the bottom left, there's Ronald McDonald there. And what it says is that if you got uh, all A's and B's, had good citizenship, or had good attendance, you could bring this report card envelope to the local McDonald's and get a free Happy Meal, OK? So we can see uh, the increase in the focus on a thing-oriented society and on consumerism in lots and lots of political discourse. So for example, after September 11th, when our country was attacked, President George W. Bush was asked, well, what can the average American do in order to help the country? And he said, the American people have got to go about their business. We cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of frightening our nation to the point where we don't conduct business, where people don't shop. Two weeks later, he was again asked, what could Americans do in order to help the country? And he said, Mrs. Bush and I would like to encourage Americans to go shopping. Why? Well, because in our country, about 70% of our economy depends directly on consumer spending. And he knew that his political fortunes rise and fall in large part on whether or not people were out there spending money. This idea of thinking of ourselves as consumers instead of citizens is not just something that happens uh, via the advertisements or via politics either. It can be seen even in uh, more academic endeavors. So here is a slide uh, which shows uh, that Guy Shrubshul did. He used Google which has a, a, a program on it called an engram search, where it can search through lots and lots of material in order to find certain words. And what this graph shows you is the percentage of words in a book that either use the word consumer or citizen from uh, about 1800 until more or less the present day. The red line is the consumer line. And what you can see is that from 1800 until about 1900, it's very rare that people are called consumers. The blue line is the citizen line. People are much more likely to be called citizens for the, from the 1800 until the 1900. But starting at around 1900 and, and uh, 1910, which by the way, is when we first start to see major department stores and modern advertising, we see, start to see a rise in the word consumer and around 1970, 
the word consumer surpasses the word citizen in terms of how frequently it's used in books to describe people. Consumers, of course, shop. Citizens get engaged in their country. So if it's the case that King is right and that what our nation needs is a radical revolution of values, when I think of that as a psychologist and as a scientist, I say, okay, well, what does that mean? What values do we need to revolt against and what values do we need to move towards? And so what I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes doing is telling you what psychologists and other social scientists have learned about values and goals. So what we know about values and goals is that they're guiding principles in life. They're ideas that we walk around with in our head that help tell us what's important in life and what's not important in life. So for example, those of you looking down at your uh, iPads doing something else have obviously decided that what I'm saying is not so important in life and you've decided that your guiding principles are going to focus you on doing something else. Those of you who have attended to me instead are, they've decided there might be something important here and I want to pay attention to it. We also have guiding principles in life that tell us what we might do with spring break. So how many of you are going to go and do some volunteer work over spring break, just out of curiosity? Okay, so your guiding principles in life there tell you that what's important is to go out there and to give back to others. Okay? Others of you, I won't ask you to raise your hands, might be going out primarily to have a good time and to party. Okay? That's a different set of guiding principles in life which might encourage you to go in a certain direction as well. Now, our guiding principles in life end up affecting our attitudes, okay? So if I'm a person who thinks that making money, for example, is very important, then that will affect my attitudes towards certain things like uh, the magazines that you might give me or the political um, ideas that people might suggest. So if people want to cut taxes to keep more money in my pocket, if I care a lot about money, I'll have a positive attitude towards that particular policy. Our values and goals also influence our behavior, okay? So on Friday afternoon at four o'clock, I have a choice I can make. I can stay and keep working, or I can go home and see my family. My values end up influencing which of those choices I end up doing, because obviously I can't do them both at the same time. Now, it might seem like there's an infinite number of different values and goals which people can pursue in life, but as it turns out, what the cross-cultural research in psychology shows is that there's actually about a dozen sets of basic values that people care about, and we find these same values emerging across different cultures. And these values are organized in systems. And this is going to be one of the most important things to understand um, in order to understand how my talk is unfolding here. So we know that uh, these value systems seem to be um, organized in similar ways across many different nations in the world. So this isn't just sort of a Western phenomena or something you find in wealthy nations. It's something that we know um, occurs in many, many different nations around the world. And what I'm going to show you is that some values and goals are relatively compatible with each other. What that means is that they're relatively easy to simultaneously pursue. But other values are in relative psychological conflict with each other, meaning that it's relatively difficult to simultaneously pursue them because they fight against each other. And in the graphs that I'm going to show you momentarily, what you'll see is that these, some values that are compatible will be nearby each other in these models, whereas values which are on the opposite sides of each other will be the ones in conflict. Now, before I show you these uh, models, what I want to emphasize is two things. The first thing is that these are not just ideas that some psychologist came up with in his head, okay, while he was sitting around at his desk one day. These are value models which have been validated in literally dozens of nations around the world with tens of thousands of people, okay? The second thing is that there's a lot more information on these uh, models than I want to focus on today. So just try to focus on the parts that um, are most relevant and that I point you towards. So if we could get the slide back up there. 
This value model comes from the work of Shalom Schwartz, okay? And it's a value model which has been uh, validated in uh, over 70 different nations around the world. And I want to focus you first on um, the values that I just made appear in red. I don't know if you can see that in the back, but it's these ones down here in the southwest quadrant of the circle. And these are the self-enhancement values for achievement and for power. So here are some of the items which people use, or which Schwartz uses, in order to assess these particular values. So these are values that have to do with power, with wealth, with achieving, et cetera. Many of the things that our consumer capitalist nation tell us are particularly important. And what you can see from this is that achievement and power values are relatively consistent with each other. So that means if you're trying to attain power, it's relatively easy to also simultaneously try to achieve things, okay? Because you can do both of those at the same time. But they stand in relative conflict with the values up there in the northeast part of the circumplex, what we call this, or what Schwartz calls the self-transcendence values for universalism and for benevolence. And here are some of the items that are used in order to assess um, those kinds of values. So things like being helpful, uh, social justice, equality, caring about the environment, et cetera. So what this means is that it's relatively difficult to simultaneously focus on power and achievement and wealth at the same time that you're trying to focus on helping the world be a better place and helping have a sustainable earth. Now this next slide is um, one that comes from the work that I've done with Fred Gruze and other folks. And I'm gonna focus here on what's similar to Schwartz's values, whoops. So here in this red circle, we see what we call the extrinsic values for popularity, for image, and for financial success. And here are some of the items that uh, we use in order to assess those particular values. And you can see these are the kinds of values and goals which are really encouraged by consumer culture, okay? Being wealthy, having the look that you're after. Your look is usually uh, mediated by the things that you own, whether it's your clothes or your shoes or your house. And then being popular, which also we often try, try to do through the things we own. And what you can see here is that these values for extrinsic goals are in relative conflict with what we call the intrinsic goals for community, for self-acceptance, and for affiliation. And so here's some of the items that we use in order to assess those values. I want to go back to the slide and point out one thing. So you'll remember from geometry that there's 360 degrees in a circle. Now the analyses that we use in order to place these dots at their different points in the circle are actually meaningful. And what we found in our analyses was that the desire for financial success is 192 degrees opposed from the desire for community. 180 degrees would represent perfect opposition, right? What this means is it's relatively difficult to simultaneously be greedy and generous, okay? You can't do those two things very easily at the same time because those are values which stand in conflict with each other. So there are two major applications of these ways of thinking about values and goals that I'd like to focus on next. And the first one is uh, what we call a dispositional approach. And my bet is this is the way that you've been thinking about values and goals so far during my lecture. So this is about like the, the, the value and goal resides in the person. And there are some people who care about certain values and goals. So if we go back to the Schwartz circumplex, I'd like you to take a second here and bring to mind somebody you know who cares a lot about achievement. Just think about that person you know. And now think about somebody you know who cares a lot about benevolence values, which is their family. And now think about somebody who cares a lot about trying to make the broader world a better place. Now that's the dispositional level of thinking about values, and that's an important way to understand values because we know that to the extent people prioritize these different values, it ends up influencing their social and ecological behavior, as I'll show you next. So what we found is that to the extent people focus on those extrinsic self-enhancing values for money and achievement and status and power, they're less empathic. They care less about how other people are experiencing the world. Similarly, 
um, the more that people take on those extrinsic self-enhancing values, the higher they are in what's called social dominance orientation. Social dominance orientation is the belief that my group is better than your group, and the reason your group isn't doing so well in life is because your group is stupid or lazy or whatever it is. The more that people believe in extrinsic and self-enhancing values, the more strongly they endorse this social dominance orientation. And furthermore, the more they believe um, in racial and ethnic prejudice, that is, the more they believe that other people um, of different races and different ethnicities are not as good as my race and ethnicity. We see similar kinds of effects when we look at people's social behavior. So for example, the more that people endorse those intrinsic and self-transcendent values, they engage in more pro-social behavior, they help more, they volunteer more, and they also engage in less antisocial behavior. They're less likely to lie and cheat and steal and do those kinds of things. Furthermore, when you have them play games with each other where you can earn points either by um, cooperating or competing, people's values influence their behavior there too. So the more that people have these extrinsic self-enhancing values, the more likely they make choices to compete rather than to cooperate. Now, these value dynamics end up also influencing the uh, ecological behavior. So it's not a very big jump to talk about, well, how do I care about other people? And then think, how do I care about other species? How do I care about um, future generations that are gonna have to live on this planet? And how I treat the planet ends up influencing that. So we know, for example, that part and parcel of what those self-transcendent values are has to do with protecting the world and uh, protecting the environment and having a world of beauty. And those values tend to be de-emphasized by folks who focus on materialism and extrinsic values. We also know that um, in studies that Wes Schultz has done, when you ask people who are more materialistic and extrinsic if why they care about environmental damage, they'll say, well, I care about it because maybe it'll hurt me. Maybe it'll mean that my beach house goes under, okay? Whereas if people are more intrinsically oriented, they tend to focus instead on the damage that uh, the environment might do to uh, other species and to future generations. Furthermore, these um, effects go on to people's behaviors as well. So the more that people are intrinsically oriented, the more they focus on uh, living in a sustainable way. They ride bikes, so use the kind of bike share program that you guys are starting up. Um, they recycle, they reuse, um, they turn off lights in unused rooms, etc. And furthermore, they have lower ecological footprints, okay? So they live in ways which are less likely to do damage to the earth. They make choices like being vegetarian, for example, which I imagine many of you are, um, which uh, is not only healthy, um, but also is a better way for sustainability. Um, they live in smaller houses and they make choices with regard to transportation that are healthier for the environment too. So that's the dispositional way of thinking about materialism and extrinsic goals and extrinsic values. Um, but there's another way to think about this, and this has to do with value activation. So the idea here behind these circumplex models is that we all have all of these values, okay? We all actually have all of these values. So what I'd like you to do next is to think about the last couple weeks of your life. And I'd like you to think about a time when you were really focused on your family. And now I'd like you to think about a time when you were very focused on trying to help the broader world be a better place. And now, especially as uh, it's midterms and such, think about achievement. Times when you were really focused on achievement and your own status. And if you're anything like me, you'll see that even though maybe at a dispositional level you care about certain values, those other values creep into your life. There's other times in your life when you end up being more focused on achievement and status or on hedonism or something like that. Because we all have all of these values. They're there to be activated in our minds. 
And in fact, we can activate, so what psychologists have been able to do is do a series of experiments where they momentarily activate people's values and get them acting in ways which are consistent with those values. Kathleen Vos was one of the first people to do this kind of a study. And what she did in these studies, she had people come into the lab and unscramble words. So they were given either um, a set of words like this, or that were neutral, or a set of words that had money in them. And so if you unscramble them, you don't have to use all the words that are in there. You can either get it is cold outside or a high paying salary. So the people in the neutral word condition just kept having to think unconsciously more or less about sort of desks and it being cold and all these kinds of things. Whereas people in the money condition had the idea of money activated in their mind. Unconsciously, they didn't know that was what was happening to them, but that's what the experimenters did to them. And then what the experimenters did was they gave everybody the opportunity to engage in some helping behaviors. So for example, in one of the studies, the um, person had either unscrambled the neutral or the money words, and then the experimenter walked into the lab with a whole bunch of pencils and pretended to trip and dropped all the pencils on the ground. They counted up how many pencils the person helped pick up. And you can see from this graph that just by having had money activated in their minds, people became less helpful. They picked up less pencils. Why? Well, it goes back to that issue of value conflict. By having money activated in their mind, it's suppressed the pro-social helping values. It's like a seesaw. As money went up, pro-social values went down. She found a similar thing when she asked people to donate. She gave everybody $2 for being in the study, eight American quarters. And then at the end, she said, oh, would you donate some of this money back to the university student fund? The people who had had money activated in their mind only donated about 70 cents on average, whereas the people who had uh, had neutral words donated almost a dollar and a quarter, a significant difference. So again, by focusing on their own money issues, they became less generous, which is what we would predict on the basis of those circle models. Now, it's important to note that this is true even in people who are dispositionally really focused on extrinsic values. So we did a study a couple of years ago where we surveyed over 700 people in the United Kingdom. And our goal was to find the people who were the most hardcore, self-enhancing, extrinsic folks we could. Okay, So we found the 30 people who scored really up high in terms of how much they cared about those self-enhancing values. And we did the rest of the study only with them. Okay, And we brought them into the lab, and we either had some of them write about why extrinsic and self-enhancing values were important, or we had them write about why intrinsic and self-transcending values were important. And then they were interviewed. They went, uh, underwent an interview where they were asked about four different topics. Two of them were environmental, and two of them had to do with social things. And, and then we crossed that by was it kind of local in the UK, or was it something that was more international? And then a linguist read all of the interviews. He didn't know anything about the primes, he didn't know anything about the people, but he read the interviews in order to see what people were talking about and what they were saying about these issues. One of the things we found was that even in this hardcore, extrinsically oriented people who cared a lot about achievement and money, when they had been asked to momentarily think about intrinsic values, they were more likely to say things like, somebody should do something about that problem. Somebody needs to do something about the loss of uh, countryside or about poor kids. Whereas in the extrinsic prime group, they didn't care so much. Furthermore, the people who were just thinking about intrinsic values also were more likely to say, and the reason we should do that is because those people need help, not because it's going to hurt me. I'm going to show you a couple of quotes here that bring this to, uh, to life, I think, hopefully a little bit more. So here is a extrinsically oriented person who's just been thinking about extrinsic materialistic values and who's talking about children dying in poor countries. And what this individual says is, it's a part of life over there, it's the way of life, that's what happens, so it's nothing to get too upset about. A pretty chilling quote, okay? 
but a quote that makes perfect sense from a point of view of an extrinsically oriented person who's not so focused on pro-social values. Here's what somebody says about climate change. Okay, what would motivate me? Well, I suppose money if there was a financial incentive. I do tend to switch things off, but that's more of a case of me saving money and electricity than thinking that's gonna help the world. So, an extrinsically oriented person who's just been thinking about extrinsic values says something purely extrinsic. It's all about the money. It's not about me trying to save the world. Here's an equally extrinsically oriented person who's been asked to think about intrinsic values for a moment. And when asked about child mortality, he says, I think it's really unfair the injustice of how some people have loads and other people have absolutely nothing, and yet it's terrible. So switches this individual into a social justice mode into thinking about a pro-social way of understanding child mortality. Here's a quote about climate change from a similar individual, extrinsically oriented but primed with intrinsic values. I do think that the earth and the environment is precious and valuable. I think it should be at the top of the political agenda. I think the world we pass on to the next generation, you know, is, is, uh, is our responsibility. Had some trouble getting it out there, okay, but was able of ultimately to say, this is important. This thing that concerns self-transcendent values is important because that idea lies there within that person's mind and it was just activated. So if it's the case that we do need a revolution of values and if it's a case that uh, values are indeed organized in the way that I've been describing, what are some ways forward? Well, this is something I've been writing about for a long time now, and I want to talk, uh, there's lots and lots of things I could say, um, but I'm just going to talk about a few different things here. So one has to do with spiritual traditions, and the other one has to do with broader cultural changes. So. Almost every spiritual tradition that I'm aware of has warned against the problem of extrinsic and self-enhancing values. So Lao Tzu, who's often recognized as the founder of Taoism, uh, said, chase after money and security and your heart will never unclench. Um, Muhammad said, riches are not from an abundance of worldly goods, but from a contented mind. And then of course, um, in the Bible, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, store up treasures in heaven. So most religious viewpoints seem to recognize this tension, okay? And indeed, if we go back to that circular model that I showed you before, you can see that those spiritual aspirations stand in relative opposition to financial success desires. So remember, 180 degrees is perfect opposition. Financial success and spirituality were 143 degrees opposed. So it's again, relatively difficult to focus simultaneously on making a lot of money and having a spiritual life. There's a tension there. So what this suggests is that to the extent we can help people engage in more spiritual practices, it might actually suppress their materialistic desires. It might actually make those things of less concern to folks. And I'm just gonna talk, there's other things I could talk about in this realm, but I'm just gonna talk about two. One has to do with gratitude. So we actually started um, this morning with a wonderful statement of gratitude, right? Um, for the wonderful weather. And I think that the film that we saw was also a statement of gratitude, right? A statement of gratitude to God for helping keep um, the woman and her friend safe, right? So. Gratitude is something which is basic, I think, especially in Christian traditions as well as in some others. And there have been researchers who have looked at gratitude as it concerns materialistic extrinsic values. So we know from a couple of studies that the more that people just in general are grateful for things, they say, well, I spend a lot of time being grateful, the less materialistic they are. We also know from one study done by Lambert um, that gratitude can actually momentarily move people away from extrinsic values. So what Lambert did in this study was the following. So he brought people into the lab and he either had them, uh, they had everybody close their eyes and then they had either people engage in thinking about feeling appreciative for what they've been given in life and then they wrote about that or to focus on a person that they felt envious of and write about that. 
And then immediately afterwards, they asked them about their extrinsic materialistic desires. How much money do you want to have? How much nice clothes do you want to have? How much do you want to travel to fun, exotic places? And what uh, Lambert found was that people who had just been induced to be grateful became less materialistic, okay, compared to the envy group. Their materialistic desires went down. They seemingly were more satisfied with what they actually had after being grateful. Mindfulness is another practice which I think is pretty basic to most spiritual traditions, you know. So we oftentimes think of mindfulness as part of a Buddhist tradition, but really praying and chanting and singing and many other things in a Christian tradition also tend to enhance mindfulness because what they do is they focus us inward and they help us be aware of and attentive to what we're experiencing, okay, in a moment. And usually they do that in a pretty non-judgmental way. That's a standard way to define mindfulness in psychology these days. And we know from the research that the more people are mindful in general, the lower their materialistic extrinsic values and the more intrinsically oriented they are. So mindfulness seems to promote this kind of value shift. And we also know from experimental evidence that uh, this can happen in a causal way. So in a study I did with Kirk Brown, we got 69 people who were going to a mindfulness training program. And these people were doing heavy duty mindfulness training, okay? They were meditating uh, many hours a a day um, for four weeks. And we tracked these people over time. And what we found was that to the extent over time people became more mindful, they became more satisfied with what they had financially. That is, they were less desirous of financial things. They were okay with where they were financially. And that in turn improved their well-being because they weren't walking around the world dissatisfied all the time. So we can make these kinds of changes in our day-to-day personal lives in terms of gratitude and mindfulness and lots of other things that have been studied. But the fact of the matter is, is as long as we remain in a, a consumer capitalist society which bombards us with messages on our cell phones and on our tablets telling us that what's important is to make a lot of money and buy a lot of stuff, to the extent we walk around the world and see these messages, we're gonna keep getting those ideas that what's really important is to focus on those extrinsic self-enhancing values because that's what our economy is built around. So we need to make some changes at a broader level. One of the things that has gained a lot of traction over the last uh, few years has to do with alternative indicators of progress. So in America and most countries right now, what we mostly focus on is how the Dow Jones is doing, um, how gross national product is, et cetera. One of the things we know, though, is, you know, gross national product goes up when people buy antidepressants, okay? Because that that means they're spending money. Gross national product goes up when crime rates go up and you have to build more prisons. Gross national product goes up when we go to war and we build lots of tanks and bullets and guns and bombs. So GNP doesn't really care about intrinsic values. All it cares about is money change hands. And so there's been a lot of efforts to uh, develop alternative indicators of progress. Another effort has to do with what I've called time affluence. So we're very focused in this nation on material affluence, but time affluence is another thing um, that we could strive for. And uh, my understanding of your spiritual tradition is that the Sabbath is very important, okay, in terms of taking that time to step away from the day-to-day grind of the regular world and have moments in order to focus on other things, not just on spiritual things, but on nature and on your health and all of the rest. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all people had more time like that, okay? So that's another sort of um, cultural change that we could be working for. I'm just gonna mention that the United States is only one of two or three nations in the world Um, that does not have mandatory paid leave for a new mother, okay? Most nations, when a woman gives birth to a child, have like, say, two, three months of paid leave. In the United States, we um, we enforce a leave, but it's unpaid, 
okay? Which means that a lot of women, especially uh, lower socioeconomic women, have to go right back to work. The main thing, though, I want to talk about is children and marketing. So, um, well, we, I just uh, got an email this morning. So there's a new Barbie coming out that has a microphone in it so that it records what the children are saying to the Barbie, and then the information goes up to the data cloud, and, and uh, the toy manufacturers analyze it in order to figure out how better to uh, manipulate that child, essentially, in the future. Okay, this is a new Barbie coming out. Children are worth a lot of money to marketers, okay? Um, and children are highly manipulated by marketers, and we know that children's ingestion of marketing messages ends up influencing their values. So we know from multiple studies that the more television that children watch, um, the more likely they endorse materialistic values. Uh, did anyone of you happen to go to a Channel One high school or Channel One middle school? Anybody know what Channel One is? Channel One is a company that makes its money by going into school districts, primarily poor school districts, says, we'll give you a free television in uh, every classroom. All you have to do in, in return is to uh, show our Channel One broadcast, which is about five minutes of news and about three minutes of advertising. So what Channel One does is to use the mandatory school laws in order to deliver marketing messages to children in a place where they can't get up and leave. Um, children in Channel One school districts uh, end up with a stronger consumer orientation and materialistic beliefs than those in matched school districts. We also know that uh, marketing to children is relevant to changes over time in kids' materialism. So here is a graph that shows the extent to which high school seniors in every year from 1976 through 2007 say they desire materialistic um, items. These were things like a bigger house, a second car, et cetera. So what you can see is that high school seniors have become substantially more materialistic over the last 30-some years. In a study Gene Twenge and I did, we correlated the change in materialism over time with how much of the United States uh, gross national product came from advertising revenue, and we found that the more advertising there was in the economy, the more materialistic kids were. So how could we proceed? Well, one thing to do is to remove ads from schools and from public places. There are companies that are trying to put ads onto uh, buses, school buses. There's ads uh, in textbooks nowadays, actually, too. Um, there are ways to stop that from happening. Another thing you may not be aware of is that all the money that companies spend on advertising is actually a tax deduction. Okay, so you know when I do my taxes at the end of the year, if I make a donation to charity, I can deduct that. I don't have to pay taxes on that. All of the money that businesses spend on advertising, including to children, is a tax deduction. They don't pay taxes on it. We're talking about billions of dollars a year here, folks. So if you tax that at 10%, you could use that money for all kinds of other great purposes to protect the environment, to educate children, et cetera. Finally, we could ban advertising to children, as Brazil just did in April, okay? Other countries had already banned advertising to children. It's been discussed in the United States. It hasn't made it very far, but Brazil just took the big step. So in summary, what I hope you see is that there's a tension between the values that orient us towards selfish, monetary, financial behavior and the values which orient us in a more pro-social and pro-environmental way. It's difficult to simultaneously focus on both of those. And that, but there are ways to shift that balance. There are ways to shift people in a more pro-social way, just like there are lots of ways to shift people in a more materialistic and extrinsic way. And we can make some of these shifts in our own life through engaging in certain spiritual practices and also by working for broader cultural change. And I think it's through these kinds of means that we can bring about the kind of revolution of values that King was discussing. Thanks for your attention.